think we are recording. Yes, we are. All right. Welcome to another Six Patterns video. My name is Max. I'm Kevin. And we have got a spectacular case for you. This is another one of our uh, series and the uh, deep dive series in pulmonary pathology, specifically looking at the approach to pulmonary vascular lesions. And this is a, uh, from a pathologic perspective, a very fascinating case. This is from a 55 year old male who presents to the emergency room with altered mental status. And he has imaging studies done and uh, he has multiple lesions in his cerebellum. Uh, which is leading to his altered mental status, but actually multiple bilateral pulmonary nodules as well. And instead of going after the cerebellar lesions, they thought it would be easier to go after the lung lesions, and so they end up on your desk instead of the neuropathologist's desk. So, here they are. Boy, Max, aren't you glad they didn't put a needle in this? Oh. So I have a funny, I have a funny story about that, Kevin. Funny story that you would ask that because. One of, the, uh, one of the cases I share with visitors, I, I have a bunch of unknown sets that I share with the visitors when they come through, right? Back when we were allowed to have visitors. And one of them is a needle core biopsy, this beautiful, generous needle core biopsy that was full of all this pink dead material here. And it had some neutrophils in it. And I said, oh, typical necrosis, neutrophils, infection, infection, infection. Um, but I was going to get my special stains, right? So I got an H&E level and I got my, my infectious stains. And on the H&E levels, I encountered some findings similar to what we're going to find in this case, which led me to dramatically revise my diagnosis that unfortunately I had already issued. So yes, I'm very glad they didn't needle this case. <laughs> yeah, that's the kind of thing that, you know, put, they put needles in things. And unless you have hindsight... And you know what it is you're looking at. It can be really difficult, like putting a needle into an intrapulmonary thymoma. That can be a really challenging diagnosis unless you think of it. So, this case, Max, we have we have what looks like a red and blue nodule. Yeah, a nodule with this central area of pinkness, and then it's got this flare around the outside of a uh, more intense uh, blue color. And I think one of the interesting things when we're talking about deep dives in pulmonary pathology and vascular lesions is that when we go to high power in this, these areas of necrosis, we can see that there are still vascular structures here that we can make out, and we can even make out the alveolar wall here. So this is yeah. not your big necrotic nodule of, of a TV. necrotizing granuloma of TV. This isn't caseous necrosis. This is infarct necrosis. So. All of a sudden, from low power, you're thinking, okay, maybe this is a big area of necrotizing granuloma. Actually, there's, this is infarct-like necrosis. This is not a granulomatous process at all. Interesting. Yeah. Not a granulomatous process at all. Interesting. So it's, a, it's in that differential diagnosis of blue tumors, isn't it? It looks like too many cells, and uh, they kind of have a... Mixed lymphoid and histiocytic. Do you think those pink little cells are histiocytes? Uh, well, there's a ton of histiocytes here, and you know, you've jumped straight to tumors. There's probably a lot of people who are still wondering maybe this is an inflammatory process, right? Yeah, I guess it just looks awfully monotonous and an awful lot of it. You know, uh, there, we, always, there, we always say if you have something this dense with lymphoid in the lung, it better be a lymph node right. or else it's a tumor. Yeah, so. Infarct-like necrosis, whenever I see infarct-like necrosis in the lung, actually, I think it's a great tip to go look at pulmonary arteries. Uh, I'm sure it's part of your normal sort of checklist when you're going through biopsies is to make sure you look at the pulmonary arteries and make sure there's no abnormalities there. But I think particularly in the setting of infarct-like necrosis, because that doesn't happen very often in the lung, and there has to be a substantial vascular injury. And I think we can kind of appreciate what's going on here. This is the sort of a pulmonary artery cut tangentially. And as we get a little bit closer to the area of infarction, we can see that there is a significant proliferation of fairly atypical cells here, undermining and lifting off the endothelium. I mean, I'm a renal pathologist too. So if I, if, if I put myself in the kidney right now, I'd be thinking about the uh, an acute cellular rejection episode with endotheliolitis, but I'd be worried because some of these cells are quite atypical. 
Yeah. So it's interesting, Max, you said that about it's hard to infarct the lung, and it is, you know, because the dual blood supply, and it's, it's just tricky. But you can imagine in this nodule, right, I don't think you're just doing arteries here. I think these atypical cells are infiltrating all the vessels in, within the nodule. So they've compromised. Usually when you compromise the arterial side, you still have sort of venous flow in, in the lung. In but fact, in this nodule, I'll bet you all the vessels are infiltrated. Like this one right here. I'll bet you this is a vessel right here. And it's been Look at totally that. infiltrated and destroyed. You can see how it's got that nice little round appearance. And that's the, that, that, that was the yeah. tip off in that, that biopsy case that I told you about at the beginning. It was seeing these sort of um, round like structures that are diffusely infiltrated by atypical cells. It really had me starting to worry that maybe I wasn't dealing with an infectious process with necrosis, but I was actually dealing with a a uh, neoplastic process or a pro proliferative process. Wow. So oh. I think we're going to need to have some stains on this. Definitely going to need some stains. Here, right in the middle of this area of necrosis, we have this kind of uh, Y-shaped uh, with a little finger coming off the edge. This is, again, another vessel. Now, I wish, the, I wish we could have some, some higher power uh, cytology to look at here. But I think people can get the sense that we are dealing with some very large and atypical cells, particularly in comparison to maybe a mature lymphocyte right here. Right. These are much bigger than, this, than a regular mature lymphocyte. And, and they're a little bit, I don't want to say cerebriform, but they're, they're nuclear contour, like that one right dead center. You know, it's, they're, their nuclear contours are abnormal. Yeah, look at that. This one has a cleft in it. Yeah. Yeah, no, these 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 are getting uh, on the way on the immature neoplastic side. So uh, at this point, I you know my tendency is I, I don't ship these off to hematopathology and then wash my hands. I, I think you got to you got to run some stains yourself first. That might be a starburst mitotic figure here. So, yeah. Kevin, what what what's a reasonable stain panel that you would start with in a case like this? Well, being a, a simplistic person, you know, I know that. CD20 positive cells are not allowed in the lung uh, outside of a germinal center. So if, if most of these are CD20, I'm, I'm shipping it to hematopathology. I'll let them work it up, honestly. If most of the, the larger cells are, are CD20 positive, right? Ship it off. But I, I, I would say that if all of those in that nodule, if they're, if they're 80 percent CD20 positive cells, I think it's going to be a lymphoma. I mean, I don't, oh, yeah. I don't know of a CD20 positive thing. You know, maybe it's maybe it's not a high grade lymphoma. Maybe it's not a diffuse large B cell lymphoma, but maybe it's something else. Exactly. So Look at the I, I mean, um, I would say even I would drop that percentage down even further, and that if you're yeah. dealing with even thirty percent or twenty percent of these cells right. being positive for CD twenty, particularly if they're not like you said located in germinal centers, if you just have this sprinkling of CD twenty positive cells, maybe accentuated within the vasculature highly highly suspicious right now i might add in a setting like this in a, a 55 year old man who presents with brain lesions and lung lesions i might add one more stain because of my suspicion for what this actually turned out to be and that's the inflammatory granulomatosis lyg lyg because so an evv for lyg evv for lyg I like <laughs> got a nice ring to it the, yes, the, the neoplastic cells of LYG are, C, are EBV positive and CD20 positive, and they can be a minority of the infiltrate. There's multiple grades of EBV from grade one, grade two, to grade three. And actually, the distinction between grade three LYG and diffuse large B-cell lymphoma has to do with whether or not there's any background benign lymphoid infiltrate. And I think we can appreciate from here that we still have a, a reasonable component of benign background lymphoid infiltrate, a lot of lymphocytes, plasma cells, et cetera. So we would have to grade this uh, using the number of EBV positive or the, the number of CD20 positive neoplastic cells uh, compared to the, the background benign cells. Yeah. But certainly acting in a high grade fashion, brain so lesions, multiple pulmonary lesions. Yeah. So my point on the stains, Max, and this is just pragmatic. 
right? If you have access to a hematopathologist, my job as a pulmonary pathologist is to identify those lesions that are going to, that are going to need a pretty complex workup. So I can do something quick and not waste too much tissue if it's a small biopsy. In a case like this, I might get a bunch of unstained CD45, CD20, CD3. Uh, you know, I don't know how much deeper I would go. I would let my hematopathology colleagues make the call. I might order an EBV, get it going, right? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, you don't want to be an obstruction. You don't want to be possessive of it. You want to give it up to somebody who's going to have to do the full analysis, I think, today. Which is which is certainly our hematopathology colleagues are the ones uh, for that. But this is a classic example of lymphomatoid granulomatosis, central areas of infarct like necrosis surrounded by a dense lymphoid rich infiltrate. Angiocentric. And then you find your vessels and you find your angiocentric component. You'll find areas where the, uh, the uh, inflammatory cells and the neoplastic cells are moving throughout the entire wall of the vessel. And it looks very much like a vasculitic process. Yeah. Other which things, is why we have it under the deep dives for vascular lesions. Which is exactly why we have it in this section. Other things that can give you sort of an angiocentric, there's a bunch of different lymphomas, particularly high-grade lymphomas, some T-cell lymphomas that can give you angiocentric atypical lymphoid infiltrates. And so I think it's always a good idea if you have angiocentric infiltrates that you do your three and a 20 and you realize their inflammatory cells have a very low threshold to reach out to your friendly hematopathologist and, uh, and get their, their input on it. Absolutely. Now, what would the brain lesions look like if they uh, biopsied the brain lesions? Well, that's an ex excellent question. I would imagine that the brain lesions are also going to be infiltrates of these atypical cells. They look absolutely identical, right? And these patients can have, they can develop cutaneous lesions, I believe, too. And they, those, those lesions look the same, too. So this is a multi-system um, lymphoproliferative process, uh, lymphomatoid granulomatosis. Great case. Thanks, Max. All right. Thank you very much. Don't forget to like and comment below and uh, let us know what else you'd like to see. Thank you. See you next time. Thanks.